So, the last name we start today, and it's my great pleasure to tell you a little bit about some interactions that are so important to Siapu Mulela. Uh, Siapu Mulela has, through the years, as you know, attended Achieving the Dream, and many of you have been there. But that's not only the thing that Achieving the Dream has done. Achieving the Dream has helped us understand student success processes, have shared their knowledge over many years, and one of the most important uh, interactions and managed is by Carol Lincoln. So I want to say to Carol, Thank you very much for all the work that you have done for us and, um, and that it will be a great pleasure to hear what you have to say about our engagement. So, um, Carol, what has happened to you? I just cancelled the video. I think this wants to go to sleep, but why? Who knows? Sorry, uh, technology is always what fails. So Carol is the managing director of Achieving the Dream, and um, which was launched in the United States in 2004. So they are having their 20th anniversary next year. And uh, they initiated the transition to a national organization. She became the senior vice president. Her career spans 50 years of experimentation and innovation with higher education and workforce sectors aimed at equality and social justice for populations and places left behind by traditional systems and organizations. And is that not so very clear to our heart as well? So there is long and interesting ways of thinking about this. And while Siapu Malela has been going for a while. Our, our next year is our 10th year. So uh, we are going to be in sync with the numbers of naught behind our kids. One for 20 and one for 10. So Carol, please come talk to us about your experience of student success and the reform of Good morning, everyone. It's great to be on this side and see your faces instead of being looking this way, so it's, you're a wonderful group. I want to start with a few apologies. Uh, Professor Pillay, are you doing well this morning? I feel so sorry that I had my three left feet stepping on yours last night. <laughs> but you're okay. Another apology for those of you who were there last night. If I disgraced or embarrassed any of you, <laughs> Bill, I sincerely hope you don't use my dancing as a metric that you judge me. <laughs> and I think I heard in something that Francois said in the last couple of days that he talks a lot about high impact practices. Is that right? Well, I want to apologize to the University of Free State. I'm going to talk about high impact practices too. <laughs> it really is a pleasure to be with you. This is not my first experience in South Africa, but it's certainly been one of the best, and it's definitely been the one where I've learned the most. It's been a real joy to hear about your success. Um, it comes to life when we're together like this, and so I appreciate the opportunity to be here. The first time I ever came to this continent was in 1998. I was working for another nonprofit organization at the time. We had a project in America that was involving 24 rural and tribal community colleges that were positioned in extremely economically challenged areas of our country. The Ford Foundation thought that there might be some lessons from what those colleges were doing that could help the University of Namibia while it was building a new northern campus in Oshikari. 
So we had the opportunity to work with UNAM for about five years in trying to bring lessons from America to their country. And we, what we did is we were working on not only helping them become a great teaching and training and research center, but also the idea was that they would work on community development and generally doing economic uplift for their community. And as I thought about what to say today, I thought, you know, that's, there's really a lot of seeds and roots from that time. This continent was already thinking about how you could deal with economic mobility. You're just using different terminology. And this is where we are now in America, thinking a great deal about how our institutions can be an instrument for advancing economic opportunity. Several people ask me, what is this achieving the dream I keep hearing about all the time? I never went to dream, I don't know what they're talking about. Well, we are a nonprofit organization with a 20 year history. We actually started out as a demonstration initiative. Um, we work with a network of over 300 community colleges. We have the goal of increasing student success and closing attainment gaps in our country. We do that very similarly to what happens through SADI. We provide coaching to our colleges. We run peer learning events. We develop tools and strategies to help our colleges advance their own reform um, initiatives. Alan gave me the assignment of reflecting on the, the progress of the student success movement, and particularly in the United States, and to reflect a bit on the benefits of the partnership that we have. And as he mentioned, it's a really good time to do so because ATD will be celebrating 20 years uh, in February of 2024, and we know that you're rapidly approaching your 10th year anniversary as well. I want to comment on the partnership first. There's been a number of benefits to our partnership. The first and most important one, perhaps, is we've had the ability to adapt best practices from one another. You started out 10 years after we did with a Sia Pumalela project. So you had the benefit of 10 years of experimentation, sometimes failure, in the United States, so that you could more rapidly take on some of the initiatives that were successful. That was a real big advantage, I think, to giving you a chance to jumpstart your own reform efforts. We've had the opportunity to exchange ideas, to create common cause, and to put focus to our work. At DREAM this year, our CEO, Karen Stout, said, we are attached to each other, knotted and secured where we cross. And she added, we are here to commit ourselves to reinvention to take on our biggest challenges, to transform our institutions and our communities. At DREAM this year, which is our annual conference of all our network colleges, we cornered several of the international delegates and did brief video interviews with them. Professor Cheryl De La Rey was one of them, formerly of South Africa, now of New Zealand. And she said, we share a common dream. We want to change the world for the benefit of our students and our communities. And then we interviewed Professor Francois Stridham, who said, at DREAM, we connect with colleagues to focus on changing society, addressing and social injustices. We have learned to put students at the center of our work, to use evidence to understand students and assess innovations, we have learned about high impact practices <laughs> and the advantage of working as a network to bring about change. And Professor Elizabeth Bowie said, we come to learn from each other, to find out about toolkits and how colleges are using the ICAT survey and other ways institutions are approaching reform. When you invite guests from America to your conferences, we benefit from learning from you, and we take back knowledge that we try to plow back into our own strategies. When Karen Stout was here, she was very impressed with what you were doing in teaching and learning, and how you were using that as a lever for change. It made it possible for her to go back home, uh, deepen our own thinking about that strategy, and we were able to improve what we were doing in that area because of what we learned. I've been paying particular attention this week to this notion that you have that we haven't fully developed 
which is this networking way you have of universities taking responsibility for various work streams and then sharing what you're learning with others. I think there's potential for us to take that strategy and use that in the U.S. When we had to um, think about ways we could support your coaches, we had to think more deeply about the way we do coaching and how we could change that to fit your context. That improved our coaching process. It made us think more deeply about that. And finally, inspiration. We absolutely love hosting international guests at DREAM. And our favorite time is the evening dinner that we have together where we share our culture and our history and just have a wonderful time. Um, Jenny Glennie said that DREAM always inspires and connects us emotionally to the work. And the leadership guru, John Cotter, says that's when change happens, when you get connected emotionally to the work. When I started reflecting on the progress of the student success movement in the United States, four big headlines came to mind. The first one is that our accomplishments are real and significant. The second is that much has been learned. But the third was continued progress is not guaranteed. And the fourth is there remains considerable growth opportunities. That's a term I learned from a South African colleague um, a week or so ago. I would have said significant challenges, but I'm now talking about growth opportunities. I want to take you back 20 years ago for just a little bit. In the United States 20 years ago, completion rates were in community colleges were dismal, single digit. And I know you're probably saying, you've got to be kidding. Why are we trying to learn from these folks who have such bad completion rates? But I want you to understand that community colleges are a little different than your universities. They are open access institutions. Anybody can go to a community college. The average age of our students is 28. Over 50% of our students are over the age of 22. People work while they come to community college. They come and they go. They seek a two-year or a one-year credential, typically. So it's a little bit different student group. But even so, the rates were dismal. At the same time, economists were telling us 20 years ago that we were not doing the right things to prepare our workforce for the global economy. At the time, 35% of the working age adults in our country had a credential that was higher than a high school diploma. The Lumina Foundation was particularly appalled by the completion rates because that's where the bulk of low-income students and students of color were entering higher education, and they were worried about what was happening with the workforce. So they set a big goal. They said, let's encourage the nation to strive to have 60% of our working age adults have a post-high school credential by the year 2026. And then shortly after, the Obama administration was inspired to set a similar goal, but by 2020. Now, these were stretch goals, to be sure. But in January of this year, we had the wonderful news from Lumina in a report they had done that we had reached an attainment of 53.7% of our working age adults having a post-high school credential. That's a tremendous, tremendous gain, 20 points in 20 years. Now, in part, that's due because we're doing a better job now of counting credentials, short-term credentials. But the vast majority of this impact is because of the hard work that community colleges and universities have been doing in the last 20 years. To my mind, there's been three significant drivers of our work, and I've heard it reflected in your work as well. First of all, and foremost for us, philanthropy has made all the difference in the world, and I want to come back to that in a minute. The other things though, that I think are driving us is certainly this belief that the evidence-based decision-making will make a difference in the performance that we do, we have, and the impact we have on our students and our communities. You've been using evidence for the last several days. It's been awesome to watch all the charts and the graphs and how much you've integrated data decision-making into everything you're doing. 
And I know you share the same North Star that we do, that you're after equity for all of your students. But if I return to the role of philanthropy again, I just want to say a few things. We would not have had the progress we've had in the United States if it were not for philanthropy. It was the Lumina Foundation first back 20 years ago that recognized the problem and said they were going to invest in putting together an initiative that initially became known as, a, excuse me, that eventually became known as Achieving the Dream. They asked seven national partner organizations to work on trying to design and implement work that would make a difference. After a few years, others, Kresge, the Gates Foundation, and others joined the effort. Government was not investing in that at that point in our history. If it had not been for the investments that were made to give us resources, to address market and policy failures, if they had not validated the innovations that were happening, if they had not shown a light upon our successful scalable solutions, and if they had not given us the opportunity to have connections to networks like yours and ours now, we would not be where we are today. Jerry Salo was a Ford Foundation program officer back around 2000 in Johannesburg. He said there is a natural tendency of systems and culture to ignore the people and the places on the periphery to the advantage of the center. But philanthropy invests in a way to bring the people and the places on the periphery to the center. And that's what we've benefited from, from the investments of our philanthropy in America. Achieving the dream says there's been three waves of reform in our country. I'm not sure everybody agrees with that, but that's the way we think. Um, the first wave, we believe, started the 20 years ago when we got going on our work when what we were trying to do is we were trying to say we should not be thinking about access only even though community colleges were created with that as a primary goal to make it possible for anybody to go to college. We needed to be thinking about what was happening on the other end, the outputs. And as I said, our rates for completion were dismal so we had to focus on completion. In the early phase of the work, colleges were concentrating pretty much on what was happening at the beginning of the student experience. How well they were transitioning into the institution, what advising they were getting. But this obsession with needing to fix the completion problem really took hold. And we were looking at completion in a variety of ways, but mostly in the credential attainment. We had a research partner, the Community College Research Center at Columbia University who was able to help us better understand what was going on. All ATD public, uh, excuse me, all ATD, pol uh, excuse me again, uh, pilot colleges were required to submit student record data to our research partners. Having that data gave CCRC the opportunity to take a look at the student experience and figure out what was happening all along the way not just at enrollment, but what happened to them along the process. What they found, again, was astounding. They found that there were tremendous leakage points where students were dropping out of the college experience. And a lot of it was happening at the very beginning when we were referring a great number of students to developmental or remedial education. They found that only one out of every six students that was referred to remedial math ever earned a college credit within three years of enrollment. They were stuck in a track of remediation that was depleting their financial resources and probably terribly discouraging them. Our colleges started trying to reinvent developmental education. They spent a lot of time on that and over several years, again, a research partner was able to point out that you know what? We didn't have to put students through long sequences of remediation. They could handle college level courses right from the start, the vast majority, if we gave them the proper supports they needed to be successful, tutoring, supplemental instruction. It was a moment, I think, was an aha moment in our progress because we were realizing that it was the institution, the structures, the policies and the practices, as Tim was pointing out the other day, that were getting in the way of our students more often than not. 
And so it was a really the beginning, I think, of us understanding deeply that we had to fix what we were doing and we had to be student ready. I said there were three waves. The second wave um, is where the bulk of our Achieve the Dream colleges are today. They've added success to their student success journey, but they're also now thinking about what is their responsibility for students once they get a credential from community college? What about success in the labor market? What about success in transferring to advanced institutions? At the second phase, our colleges are thinking about economic mobility, and they're thinking about how other aspects of the student journey beyond the beginning connection point is really making a difference. They're tackling teaching and learning issues. They're working on new strategic partnerships. They're trying to make sure that when students leave college, they are able to be successful in the labor market, and they're able to be successful if they choose to go on to a four-year education. The third wave, which only some of our colleges are in, is taking it an even bigger step forward. And what we're thinking about here is we're thinking about the responsibility and the opportunity that our institutions have to make a bigger difference in the community by calling attention to the structural inequities inside our communities, not just inside our institutions, but inside our communities. In the third way, we believe colleges should be working more strategically with community partners and with community leaders on finding ways to make equity and opportunity a community goal so that our communities have the opportunities for students to be successful and we have a vibrant community that thrives for everybody. We're working on a framework for that. It's in draft stage. We've got 16 of our colleges are working with us on trying to figure out what would be the metrics if that's the new goal for our colleges. And we expect to provide a, this um, draft framework and the suggested metrics at DREAM in February of 2024. I'd like to share a story of just one of our colleges. It's one of our high performing institutions that this year won an award that we give called the Leah Meyer Austin Award. It's given to the college that's achieved great success in improving overall student outcomes, but they also have to close significant equity gaps. Sinclair Community College serves 30,000 students annually. They're located in Ohio. Um, they've been at this for a long time. They started working in Achieve the Dream in 2005. I love this graph. I think it tells a really interesting story. The colors may be a little bit hard for you to follow. The top line that's in black color is the three-year graduation rate. Now, I understand we're two-year institutions, so if you're on time, you can get a two-year degree in two years. But most of our students do take longer. The three-year graduation rates for first time in college is the top black line. The red line, I believe, is for the African-American males and the blue line is for all the minority students. It's taken 17 years, but they have gone from that single digit of 6%, I know it's bad, was bad, to 38%. It's taken 17 years, but that's what they've done. I think even more remarkable what they've done is they've virtually closed the gap, particularly for African American males, which is an important target group for them because of the proportion of those people in their community. And they've nearly closed it as well for all minority students. That's a huge accomplishment. I think another piece of the story that this graph shows is look at how flat the improvement rates were for about seven or eight years. There was a lot of work going on, but there wasn't much impact on the metrics. Our research partner now, CCRC, tells us that it takes anywhere from seven, eight, nine years for a major reform strategy to take root and really start showing an impact. And I know you have some concern about your improvement rates in your country, but just think about this. Seven to eight years, look how long it took Sinclair, and look at where they are now. So don't be discouraged if your rates are flat right now. Be encouraged that you can still make significant gains as things root and take off. 
And I suppose the other big lesson from this is that it takes time. There isn't one silver bullet that instantly changes the trajectory of your students. It takes time. It takes a lot of efforts. In Sinclair's uh, case, they were involved in a lot of reform initiatives, but they found it really helpful to have one big vision. They recently set a goal, for example, to reach 50% graduation rate by 2027. Everybody in the institution knows that's the goal. Everybody knows what their role is in trying to get to that, that point. They put a framework in front of everybody. In their case, their framework is this one, where they bucketed everything they're doing at the early entry stage of college in one place. They have bucketed what happens in the early first year. They have bucketed all their strategies that are happening along the way in the second year. And then finally, what happens towards the end of the student progression. And as a result, Everybody sees where their program, where their activity fits in the grand scheme of things. And even more importantly, what they've done with the various initiatives they've had, they've been able to braid them together in a way that they add up to more than the sum of their parts. One of the other things they do so well is they pay attention to what the research says are, are effective practices. So this is just one example. When their students come, the first time in college, when they come to their institution, they give them a recipe card. This happens to be the recipe for anybody who's going to be a full-time student. They have another recipe card for those who are going to be part-timers. So this recipe says, if you do five things in your first year of college, you will be four times more likely to graduate than if you do not do them. So the first thing is decide upon your major area of interest. The second thing is to go to advising and get an academic map so you know what courses you need to take. The third thing is to take English and math in your first year. The fourth thing is to take at least 30 credits in the whole year. And the fourth thing is to make sure that nine of those credits are in the area of your interest. When you do this, you're four times more likely to graduate. So taking advantage of what we know from other institutions, from what the national research is telling us, is really an important thing for colleges to be doing. When I first started working on this assignment from Alan, I just started jotting down, what are all the things we've learned? Well, it was a very, very awesome long list, and I decided that there's no time today to share all of it. So I've tried to bucket them into a few different categories. The first one is that about 10 years into our work, Achieving the Dream was reflecting back on what have we learned about what are the characteristics of colleges that seem to be making greater progress than other colleges. And we came up with this scheme that you've now been um, introduced to, our ICAT, the Institutional Capacity of Assessment Framework and Tool. And what we, what we realized was there were certain foundational capacities to help accelerate and sustain reform in institutions. So if they paid attention to building their data and technology capacity, if they paid attention to their teaching and learning improvements, if they had strong leadership and a strong vision, these things were the types of things that would sustain their work over the long haul. We did a whole lot of understanding about who our students are through qualitative analyses, focus groups, just like you've done. And we learned a lot more about who our students were, that they, had, they came in very different packages and styles and various experiences. I recently heard of a new term. I don't know if it is new or I just got exposed to it. But there's a term now called and er students. Our students are students and parents. They're students and caregivers for elderly uh, family members. They're students and workers. They're students and military service personnel. And often that and part of who they are is really a higher priority than their education, even though it's terribly important to them that they go to college. And our institutions have to recognize that and understand that and make accommodations to the fact that they have busy, complicated lives and we are not the only thing they are trying to accomplish. 
We've learned the importance of having a strong vision, of having a framework like I shared with you from St. Clair. We've learned the importance of high impact practices and students and other non-traditional leaders enroll in and graduate from college. We've also relearned, I think it's a relearning exercise, how important leadership is, but not just at the top of our institutions. It's critical that our VCs, our presidents, our boards of trustees buy into this and support the student success goal. But it's also critical that we use the leaders deeper in our institution, among faculty and staff, to be part of the design process, part of the innovation, and part of the implementation, of course. We've learned that it's extremely important to target professional learning to what we're trying to accomplish in student success. It's not good enough to just let people go to a conference and say, that's your professional development experience this year. We have found that it's important to organize the opportunities that we give to faculty and staff for professional learning around the key strategies that we're trying to use to increase student success. We've learned the importance of strategic partnerships with K through 12 institutions to improve the transition into college, with employers to better align curricula with workforce needs, with community-based organizations so that we can improve upon the variety of holistic student supports we can give to students, sports that the universities perhaps cannot afford themselves, and partnerships with community leaders that can help us build a community-wide equity agenda. I think most important uh, are the last two. We've learned to integrate multiple strategies into a common braided strategy. And perhaps the biggest and most important of all is the understanding that this is an ongoing journey. It doesn't happen in the short run. It takes dedicated, long-term commitment to the work to really have an impact. Frankly, it's an amazing collection of lessons. If we were breaking them down further, we would be spending all day talking about what they are. I said one of the headlines was, continued progress is not guaranteed. And these are some of the headwinds or growth opportunities that we have in America. Just yesterday, our Supreme Court struck down the practice of affirmative action. Universities can no longer use race or ethnicity as an added care, uh, element in when they make a decision about who to select and, and invite to enroll in college. This is not likely to have a big impact immediately on community colleges because we're open access institutions. But history has shown that in states that have struck down affirmative action previously, the percentage of low income and minority students that are in more of our elite and four year institutions goes down. So this is a big threat to our agenda. We have daily attacks, it seems, on diversity, equity, and inclusive activities at community colleges. States are defunding. They're saying if you have a DEI office, you have to close it. If you have initiatives that are using state money to pay for equity, you gotta stop it. Frankly, we're worried about how many of our colleges will be permitted to come to DREAM this year. And we considered what to do about that, we said, you know what, we have to stay, we have to stay true. We have to do what we said we were all about. We have to keep the emphasis on equity. We are not gonna back down. We're gonna find ways to help our colleges move on even when we have this headwind. There are doubts about the relevance of higher education. A recent survey of high school seniors found that 20% said that they don't think college is worth the time and effort. That's up from 9% before the pandemic. We're going through a decade-long decline in enrollments. It's been particularly difficult for black students. 46% decline in their enrollment. We have low throughput rates generally in our country. We've been improving over 20 years, but we're still at only 26.6%, which is not nearly good enough. We have persistent equity gaps. Another Heckinger report has recently said that white students are two and a half times more likely to graduate than black students and 60% more likely to graduate than our Hispanic students. Even our most experienced colleges tell us they continue to struggle with data capacity. It's not just that their IR staff are turning over and leaving, which is happening, but they're trying to push the data culture deeper into their institutions. 
Well, that continues to be a challenge to keep up with all the new data that we have, to understand which ones are really going to help us, and to make sense out of it, and to take advantage of the new technologies that exist. In America, we need to do a better job of combining our academic and our career preparation. We've tended to think of them as two different operations. We need to blend them. Because people come to college and then go off to work. They come back for more skill training and then they go off to work. And we have to learn how to accommodate that. The pace of credentialing in our country needs to be uh, adjusted. Students don't want to stay for two years. They want to come and get some quick skills and go out in the labor market and get some money so they can support their family. The impact of COVID, our faculty and staff are exhausted, absolutely exhausted, and they're leaving the profession. This is happening particularly in some of our more challenged rural communities. We've also had a significant learning loss. The most recent National Assessment of Educational Progress found that we had, for the first time ever on that test since it's been given in the 1960s, a significant and first time ever drop in math scores of our nine-year-olds, and another big drop in reading. At this point in time, the math performance of our 15-year-olds trails behind 40 other countries. And our performance of our fourth graders in math trails 30 other countries. At Dream, Raj Shetty, as some of you have mentioned, talked about uh, the, what we learned from the big data sets that we have access to now. And we found that the vast majority of low-income students and their families are stuck in the lower quintiles of economic wealth in America, and they aren't moving up. And this is exacerbated by the fact that racially minoritized students in our systems are less likely to enroll in fields of study that lead to higher earnings, which of course is limiting their opportunity for, to advance economically. So significant headwinds, but don't be, don't despair, because as we said at the beginning, we're in this together. It's a long time push. It's not over. At ATD, we're looking forward to another year of partnership with you. We want to work with your coaches and with your institutions to continue pushing on building data capacity. We are offering some complimentary registrations to our data and analytics sum, uh, summit in September and other comp registrations to DREAM in February. And of course, we're going to keep giving you access to all of our tools and all of the webinars and learning events that we have. I want to finish where I started. I want to go back to my experience with the University of Namibia. That was a big deal for me. I had never been to Africa. To be invited to be part of that was fantastic. I didn't want that experience to end. And I feel the same way about our partnership. We have so much more to do together. I want to leave you with this one last image. That nonprofit organization that I was associated with back then was a nonprofit that was dedicated to increasing access for the people and the places left behind. That was kind of our model. Uh, we were about poverty reduction. We were about addressing social and economic injustices and inequalities. And a journalism student once was interviewing our CEO and said, well, can you please just say in one simple sentence what it is you do? He had a really great way with words. He was quick on his feet. And he said, we are a flaming red dress in a sea of grand flannel suits. A flaming red dress in a sea of gray flannel suits. That's what I think we have to be. Unabashedly, unapologetically committed to student success and equity, making it possible for all of our students and our communities to thrive. That's what I think our students and communities want us to do. That's what I think you have been doing. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be with you. Thank you for all the work you're doing. I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you. So, Ken, thank you very much for 
doing this for us. And it's such a great honor to have you with us today. So we're a little late, so we're not going to have any questions, but there's tea time and lunch time. <laughs> so here is a present for you from us to say thank you very much. And you will remember us as uh, for a long time. And we look forward to our wonderful uh, experiences together. Thank you. Another hand of applause.